Hey, hello, and welcome to New Hope Community Church. My name is Pastor Brian. Glad you could join us this morning. We're going to be continuing in our series on the letter to the Philippians. Uh, this is a letter that was written by Paul uh, to the people who are following Jesus in the city of Philippi. Uh, through this series, we've already done uh, some background on the city of Philippi, which becomes really important. It is a Roman colony, which is specified in the book of Acts. When Paul visits there, he clearly states that this is a Roman colony. It became a colony because after the assassination of Julius Caesar, the uh, the people who assassinated him, so Brutus and Cassius, they basically went on the run as Mark Antony and Octavius gave uh, went in pursuit. There was the final battle between these two factions at the city of Philippi, or near the city of Philippi, in which uh, Mark Antony and Octavius beat, Octavian beat, uh, or defeated uh, Cassius and Brutus, and then Octavian became Caesar, name changed to Augustus, so Caesar Augustus. And to reward some of his veterans, he gave them land and property in Philippi and gave Philippi the status of a colony. That was a very specific language that gave them special status, special treatment, special prestige, special tax benefits in the Roman Empire. So they were set aside as something special. Uh, they had um, a special privileges. And so again, that becomes uh, significant as Paul uh, is nearing the end of his letter here. Uh, we talked the first week about how we are called to treat people differently as followers of Jesus. Paul lives this out beautifully in the city of Philippi. We looked in the book of Acts as to how he responded to those people who were persecuting him and how he set aside his Roman citizen status in order to focus on and, and be the image bearer of Christ as he was being persecuted, as he was being locked up, as he was being beaten, he was still focused upon representing Jesus and sharing the message of Jesus and doing it well, even to those who were persecuting him. Uh, the second week, we, uh, we pointed out how Paul was saying, have an attitude. And very specifically, he was saying, have this attitude, this one that is of Jesus, the attitude of Jesus and, and uh, how Jesus even though he was equal to God, he set that aside. Even though Jesus is God, he set that aside and took on the form of a servant. And so when the God of the universe decided to come down in human flesh, which is just incomprehensible there, we just kind of take that for granted. But the God of the universe comes down in human flesh and decides to become relatable to his people what he chooses to do, what he chooses to show them is to be a servant. That's what he wanted to reveal about himself. He is a servant. And so Paul's saying, have this attitude of Jesus. Be a servant. Show humility. So that was the first two chapters in Philippians. There's only four chapters in Philippians. So we're going to cover chapter three today. Next week, we'll cover chapter four, God willing and finish up the series. And so uh, we're going to jump right in chapter 3 of the, the letter to the Philippians. This is in the Newer Testament, written by the Apostle Paul, and he begins this way. Finally, my brethren and sisters, it's all, all believers, uh, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard to you. And then he says this, beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. 
So this is interesting. Again, uh, we're taking an ancient text that's written originally in Greek, and we're putting it into a language that you and I understand. We're putting it into English. But as we look at this uh, idea here, false circumcision, in the ancient Greek, it is more literally the idea of mutilation. Okay, Paul's saying, beware of those who mutilate. In other words, beware of those who are, are so focused upon rituals and outward appearance and activity that they are not grasping the purpose and the reality of why we do what we do. Why is it that we do any of the things that we do as followers of Jesus, as God's people? He's saying there are those out there who would say, you need to do uh, these things like circumcision uh, in order to be a follower of God, when they're focusing their attention on external things as opposed to the heart. Okay, that's what God has always been after. He's always been after our heart. And so there are those who would, and Paul puts it, they would just mutilate you. Uh, but there are those of us who are the true circumcision, who truly understand what it means to allow God into our heart and live out of a love of God as opposed to out of a o obedience to rules. And there's a big, big difference. So Paul's saying, beware of them. There's a lot of them. Beware of the, the, those who are focused on ritual without the, the heart and love that is supposed to be driving any of that. Uh, he's building a case against who is and who isn't truly a Jesus follower. Who is and who isn't truly walking in the way that Jesus has called us to, that he showed us an example of. So he's saying that there is a value in activities because he talks about a true circumcision, but only if, only if it's done in Christ from the heart with a love for God that translates into a love for people, okay? Now, we do that today. We're terrible at this today. So many uh, kind of fall into this idea of, of mutilation. In other words, we get so involved in outward activity without really grasping what the point of the purpose is. How many people attend church just because you're supposed to? without truly going, oh, I'm going to draw closer to God, to learn more about him because I love God and because I love the community that God has created, because I want to help mankind, because I want to, to uh, be an, a, an agent in the mission of the Messiah that says that I will grant and help uh, bring freedom to people, help bring provision to people, help to restore people's relationships to God and to one another. All of these ideas, but see, we just say, oh, I'm just going to go to church. I go to church and I'm done. That's equivalent to the mutilation that Paul's talking about. Or how many of us say, well, I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to, I'm going to go underwater and, because somewhere I heard that that's what you have to do in order to go to heaven. And, and if we're being baptized just because it's a thing that is considered religious, it's like it's, it's the same as mutilation. It, it's, it's no point, no purpose. All you're doing is getting wet. That's all the person is doing. So if uh, we also sometimes take communion, I mean, Paul talks about this. People were doing it in his day. They were taking communion without realizing the depth and the meaning of it, that we're proclaiming the death of Jesus in the death, in, in the bread, in the cup. And, and so, but we just go up and we haphazardly take it. We don't think about it. We don't think about uh, where this originated. Why is it we do this? It's all equivalent in the church today to what Paul is talking about and equating to mutilation. So he then goes on and he talks about uh, glory in Christ Jesus, and I put no confidence in the flesh. A and we would then need to understand that Paul's pointing out another idea, another example of the dogs, the, the, the evil workers, and the false circumcision or the mutilators, those who mutilate. So he's saying that if you have confidence in the flesh, there's a danger in that. And so then we 
asked the question, what do you mean by confidence in the flesh? Well, it's a great question. Paul anticipated it. He goes on to answer that question because he says, if anyone else has a, a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Then he explains what he means by having confidence in the flesh. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, I'm found blameless. And so Paul is saying, listen, I am a model citizen. I am an Israelite, and not just any Israelite. I'm this certain brand of Israelite. I've come from a certain tribe that carries a status that is important and is seen as something special. I, I am this like this party of Israelite that is better than the rest of the other Israelites. Uh, I, I am better than the other kind. I am been chosen by God. And and that is is how he could find confidence in the flesh. He says, I am a perfect example of what a real Israelite should be, is supposed to be. But, but, he says, but whatever things were gained to me, all of these things that I could have had confidence in the flesh for, whatever they were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish, and so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Oh, this is huge and it's beautiful and it, it's so much wrapped up in this. Listen, he's saying, I was a perfect Israelite with all of the proper Israelite status. And he says, and all of that, that it amounts to rubbish. Rubbish is a really nice way of saying dung or excrement. He said, it doesn't amount to anything. It's, 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 it's garbage. It's, it's like worse than garbage. It, it's, it, it's excrement. And even more than that, even, even it, all things, not just what I have put my confidence in, but all things, not just that, but anything else that you can possibly think of that would give you confidence in the flesh, he says, whether it's my status, uh, status in my country uh, of Israel, or whether it's all the privileges and the prestige and the rights and the recognition, they all not only take a back seat, but they're excrement. And along with any other thing that I might possibly say, well, this gives me confidence in the flesh. This gives me status. This gives me some sort of legitimacy. All of that is excrement in comparison to Jesus, to knowing Jesus. He even says the righteousness, he's, he's kind of speaking um, hypothetically or sarcastically, uh, the righteousness that I have that comes from the Older Testament law. I understand there's beauty in the law, but again, if you're doing it out of ritual, it's wrong, it's in the wrong place. But he's saying, the righteousness that I have that comes from the Old Testament law, that's garbage. It's my faith. It's my trust in Jesus that makes the difference, that brings a righteousness that is true righteousness, that is God's righteousness, not one that I, I think that I've attained on my own. Now, I'm going to remind you, who is it? that Paul is talking to. He's talking to the people in Philippi. He's talking to the people who have defeated the assassins of Julius Caesar. And as a result of that, they have received a privileged status. They have received tax benefits. They have received monetary incentive 
for who they are and what they've done and where they live and the title that has been put upon them. They are a Roman colony. That's huge. A Roman colony. That is that is status. That is big. That is confidence in the flesh. They fought for Caesar Augustus. They are the are, are, are the loyal followers of Caesar Augustus. And they are not only Roman, but they're on the right side of the Roman politics. They are on the correct side of the Roman politics. We understand, we know, I am a true Roman. I'm the best kind of Roman. You see, we put down those dogs that were trying to manipulate the way that Rome was governed. And it, now even the law says, I'm important. That has some real significance in the culture of Philippi. And Paul says all of that, dumb. It's excrement. It's rubbish. It means nothing. Listen, these people held so tightly to their status that they equated it with favor from the gods. They thought the gods were shining down upon them and approved of them because of this. So as, as Paul is explaining all this, he tells them, listen, if status meant something, if, if any of this stuff really meant something, then I would have far more reason to boast than any of you because I'm a Hebrew. I'm an, I'm an Israelite. I, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Pharisee. I'm God's chosen. But he's saying even my status and all of those things, it doesn't mean anything. And if that doesn't mean anything, with Paul's so-called status, then your status as a Philippian doesn't mean squat. Take that and apply that to today. And, and ask the question, what are we seeing in our culture that we put confidence in in the way that Paul is explaining here? Do you put confidence in your job title? Do you put confidence in, in, in your bank account and the, the amount of money that you make or how much you have saved or the car you drive or your political party, do you have confidence in that? Does that define who you are? Does that give you a status? Uh, what about your sports team? Is that something that, that you think that is um, more important and makes you better and gives you privileged status? What about your status as an American? Do you think that your status as an American as something that gives you special privilege and, and special honor? Uh, what about the color of your skin? Do you think that places you in a category that's different and honored and privileged or, or gives you some sort of status somewhere in society? Listen, Paul says all of that, all of that in comparison to knowing Jesus and, the, and, and, and sitting any of that and all of it combined next to knowing Jesus, it's excrement, it's dung, it's garbage, it's rubbish, it's nothing, it's squat, it doesn't mean anything. Paul says, I was more than all of those things. And even to Paul, it didn't mean anything. Anything that has value, it has to come, it has to be based upon faith, not ritual, not status, not even law, whether it's Older Testament law, whether it's Roman law, or whether it's American law today, none of those things matter. What matters is what comes from faith and is practiced through Jesus out of our hearts, out of a changed heart, and it's expressing love towards God and towards our fellow human beings. So, the question then, what is it all for? What's the purpose? Well, he says that I might know him. He's using this language again, that I might know him. He, he said that in all those other things, knowing Christ, 
right? Surpassing value of knowing Christ. That's the point. That's the goal. And so he says here, that I may know him, that I might know Jesus. And it's a lifelong pursuit. You're not going to snap your fingers and know Jesus. And how is it that you get to know Jesus? It's the same way you get to know anybody or anything. That means you spend time with him and you ask questions of him and you become interested in him. That's how you know Jesus. You spend some proximity and closeness to him, learning, curiosity, affection, following, listening. It's those things. And the power of his resurrection. We think of resurrection as some future event, and there will be some culmination of future resurrection, a physical resurrection. But Jesus offers us a resurrection today, a resurrection of heart and mind and soul an emotion and relationship, a resurrection of these things that teaches us that we can live real life. Instead of being the walking dead, we can have real life now, here and now. And that's defined by God. It's not defined by by government, it's not defined by your status in Rome, it's not defined by any of those things. Resurrection is offered now through Jesus. And then it also says, and this is maybe some of the, the, the hard part for so many of us, it says the fellowship of his sufferings. Everything about Paul's earthly status as both an Israelite and as a Roman should have meant a life of comfort for him. Should have meant a life of plenty for him. But he forfeited all of those things. He forfeited the titles. He forfeited all of that stuff that he had access to and so that he could focus on others. Throwing off the trappings of society, he suffered. He suffered. And he didn't do it just once. And he didn't do it for the sake of suffering, for, for piety's sake, but he did it with a much bigger picture in mind. He suffered and so that he could bring redemption into chaos. He could bring shalom into uh, chaotic places. Redemption back into the Father's house for the lost and the sick and the broken and the poor. He brought freedom to people who were oppressed, equality to, to the outcasts, to the marginalized. And then he says, not that I have already obtained it or have become perfect. Okay, this, this word perfect here, and Paul's not saying that he's perfect and, and he's not uh, calling us to be perfect. The word perfect, again, in the original language, the Greek language is this word that means I, I'm not done yet. He's not saying, he's saying, I'm not done yet. I, ha I haven't finished yet. I'm still in process. I'm still working at, because I have breath in my lungs. I'm still working in that direction. It's the same uh, group of words, this word perfect, that, that Jesus used on the cross. When he was dying on the cross and his last words is, it is finished. It's kind of the same same word, same word group. It is perfect. It is done. It is completed. Paul's saying, I'm not done. And, and there's also this aspect behind it of an appropriate amount of maturity that is based not on just your physical age, but your spiritual age. How long have you known Christ? What is it you know about him? What are your abilities? All of that. Is it being put to use? Is there a, a maturity there? A a perfection for where you are in the moment it's all a process he says but i press on so that i may lay hold of that for which also i was laid a hold of by christ jesus brethren i do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet but one thing i do forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead this is again some beautiful uh, word play here because what what paul is saying is i have not i do not regard myself as laying hold of it yet 
he's saying, I'm not finished, but remember the attitude that we talked about in uh, last week, week two, and when Paul says, have an attitude, have an attitude of Jesus, and then he explains the attitude that Jesus had, who Jesus, although he was in the, existed in the very form of God, did not regard, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. Now he is, he's God, he's part of the Trinity. There is an equality between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But Jesus was saying, I, I, I emptied myself of that. I didn't cling to that. I came and I became a servant. Paul is saying, listen, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. So I'm not going to act as if I'm finished. I'm not going to act as if I'm done. I'm not going to act as if I have salvation in everything that God offers me. Although there is a sense in that he does. He does have salvation. He does have redemption into the Father's house. He does have adoption as a, a child of God. He does have those things. But he's saying, like Jesus, who's not going to... Um, sit and, and use his status, his privilege as a, a way of, of um, slothfulness or uh, being entitled. He's just going to use it as fuel, as fuel to keep him going, as, to keep him to, in persevering, to keep him moving forward. Basically, Paul's saying, I'm having the attitude of Christ. And I'm going to keep going. So he says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect. So he's stating that there are those who are, again, perfect in the idea here as mature. So are those who are, are doing everything that they should be doing for God. There are those who are working to their utmost potential for God in the moment. Have this attitude. Here it is again. He's saying it again, have this attitude. That's everything that we covered last week. Have this attitude. Have this attitude. And if there's anything different, uh, anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Paul's again encouraging us. Listen, live as Jesus look at the model that Jesus set for us. And then Paul explains how he is living in the model that Jesus set for him. He's saying, I have set aside any of my privilege, any of my status, anything that I might have uh, confidence in, I have set it aside in order to serve, which is precisely what Jesus did. He humbled himself and became a servant. Then he says, brethren, join in following my example. I understand when he says, brethren, join. First of all, it's all believers, brothers and sisters, join in following my example. What's Paul's example? Jesus. Jesus is Paul's example. And observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Paul says he weeps over this. 2,000 years later, we're still plagued with the same thing. You still need to be aware of the same things. There are many who are in proximity, claiming faith, who are, are attending worship, going to church, who are enemies of the cross. Even though they claim the cross, they're enemies of the cross. They don't want anything to do with the suffering of the cross. The suffering that the cross announces as a follower in Christ. The cross, a, a torture uh, device, a, a execution device 
There are those who claim Jesus who want nothing. They're enemies to everything that the cross stands for. So far as humility and service, these people, their goal is power. Their goal is influence. But he says that their end is destruction. They, they would rather than, than being having a servant God, they, they want a God of their own comfort. These are people who exalt their, their own ideas and they use God's name to exalt their own ideas, seeking glory by that. And he's saying that's shameful. They're focused on things, temporary things, things of this broken world. They're, they're wanting to gather more and more of these broken things that this culture and society deem as important, but are in reality not something that is part of the kingdom of God. Because here's the key. He says, for our citizenship, is in heaven. That's huge. Our citizenship is in heaven. Again, remember, he's talking to the Philippians. The Philippians, man, they are citizens of Philippi. They've got status. They've got privilege. He's saying, no. No, that's not the point. This is your identity. Your identity is in the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of Philippi. It's in the kingdom of heaven. It's not in the, 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 the kingdom of, of Cincinnati. It's not in the kingdom of New Hope. It's not in the kingdom of, of Republican Party or, or Democratic Party. It's not in the kingdom of America. It's not in the kingdom of white or black or, or Asian or, or Latino. It's not in the kingdom of anything other than the kingdom that is ushered in by Jesus Christ through the servitude and humility of the cross. Through faith. Through faith in that. Through trust in that. We are citizens of heaven. First and foremost, citizens of heaven. And that means that we're not simply in the presence of God or, or in a proximity of God, but knowing God knowing God to the point that we are reflecting God to the world. We are being image bearers of God. So we, here and now, are citizens of a kingdom where Jesus is king. He is our savior. He is our identity. He is our love. He is our example. And He will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to the subject, even to subject all things to Himself. He will do it. Jesus will do that. Let's model ourselves after the Jesus that is the one that's recorded in scriptures. Listen to, to me here. Because we too often want to model ourselves after the Jesus that we think will be we have a very clear picture of the Jesus of the Gospels. A humble servant who went to a cross, who washed feet. We have a very, very clear picture of that Jesus who loved the outcast, who sat and, and dined with the sinners, who seek, sought those who were lost, 
who reconciled relationships. We have a very clear picture of that Jesus. When Jesus returns, let's see, because we, we want to think about the Jesus of the future, not the Jesus of the past, okay? We, we want to think about the returning Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, not the first coming of Jesus. But listen, when he returns, he will come as a victor and a king, no doubt. Scripture is clear, but I think it will be much different than we imagine much different than we imagine understand that in new testament times god's people were expecting the messiah and they were expecting him as victor and king and that's exactly what jesus did when he showed up he came as victor and king but he looked nothing like what they expected to see they were expecting a military hero. And now he's saying, the Bible tells us that Jesus will be returning as victor and king, and you and I still have the idea that he's going to come as a military ruler when he didn't come that way the first time. He says that he came in humility and service, and that's the Jesus. That's the Jesus that we're supposed to have be, be following. That's the Jesus that we have been given as an example. We don't want to model the Jesus of the Gospels. We want to model our concoction of Jesus from the book of Revelation. We see Jesus himself. He has not come with force. He has not come uh, to be victor over people, to be an oppressor, to be a dominator. So let's not usurp him. Let's follow his example. Let's follow the example that we have of Jesus, not the one that we think will happen. He said, follow me. Let's follow in his footsteps. He did not say, hey, anticipate who I will be. The future and how he returns, that's up to him. We follow in his footsteps, not proceed him. Have the attitude of the Jesus who humbled himself and served unto death. That's our king. That's the kingdom where we are citizens. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for oh, your message. Uh, it's so incredible to be able to read through uh, these letters written 2,000 years ago and see how relevant they are today. Lord, I pray that we can open our eyes and see that what Paul is overlaying in, in this letter to the Philippians is, is exactly the issues that we struggle with today and that we deal with today. Lord, help us to not put confidence in the flesh. Help us to be uh, humble and servants just as Jesus showed us. Help us to set aside any any thought of privilege or status or rights that we might have that are afforded to us through our titles or through our jobs or through our location, again, our skin color, our, our country, our constitution, or any of those things, Lord, but let it all be rubbish and so that we might seek to know the surpassing glory of being known by Jesus. Lord, we thank you so much for revealing yourself to us through the pages of Scripture. I pray that our eyes and our ears and our hearts are open to you, who you truly are, and that we follow in your footsteps and not attempt to lead. We thank you. We ask for your blessing. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, uh, pick up your Bibles. This God is so incredible. And he's speaking directly to you today. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Hope to see you soon.